Hello all, Creeperoni here. What you'll hear in this video are submissions to my Halloween Creepypasta contest. You can show your support for the stories you like most by commenting below, and your feedback will help me decide a winner on October 28, 2016. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoy what these talented writers have to offer. I notice she only comes here when it rains. She must appreciate the weather much more than I. It's always cold here, no matter the time of year. At night, the sky was bright with stars, open and wide, a truly marvelous view over the waters. But when it rained, the fog and clouds seemed to smother this cove. But that was when I loved to come here. Over time, I noticed the girl that came here also. She was new here. Well, as new as a few months. Her beautiful brown face was rare around these parts. From my shelter, I would watch her when she would come to the cove. It was almost a ritual with her, it seemed. I'd watch her vehicle park near the rocks. She'd sit in it for a few minutes, then get out, stretch, and take a deep breath breathing in the mists and the cool New England air. Her hair would start to shimmer as the rain fell upon it. She would close her eyes, then walk towards the rocks on the beach. There was a rock outcropping in particular that she liked. It stuck out into the water, with foamy waves crashing on either side. I too loved the salty, cool sea air. It was the reason I came back here so often and during the rains. I felt calmer and more relaxed. I watched this girl for months. So much so, I began to feel at ease around her. Her sense of peace made me want to talk to her. But I was scared. She was one of those people who exuded such a quiet power and confidence. She could cow you without even looking in your direction. Over time, I think she noticed me but waited for me to make the first move. Gathering myself, I waited for the next rains. It rains heavily at least twice a week here in New England. I could hear the car now. I smiled a bit inside. I had a friend to share the cove with. Hopefully, she won't be offended by my presumptions. She sat on the rocks taking a drink of whatever it was she drank each time. She wore shorts and sneakers frequently. She exposed as much of her skin as possible to the water, which doused her every time. I began my walk to her spot. Although I felt a sense of peace emanate from her, I had no wish to disturb her. She probably came here as much as I did, to drink in the serenity. I was beginning to wonder if you were ever going to say hello, she said without looking back. It shocked me that she spoke as though she'd wanted me to come over all this time. I gathered my wits. Uh, hello I stuttered. I, I see you like this cove as much as I. My name is Lori. A pleasure to meet you, I said, extending my hand. She turned and looked at me with eyes of fiery amber, then took my hand. Hello, Lori. A pleasure to meet you. My name is Abigail, but please, call me Abby. She smiled. Come sit, Lori. The stones are wet, but I like it. It keeps me cool and the mist feels good against my skin. Thank you so much, but that is your special place. Mine is over there, I mentioned, pointing behind me. Abby looked over my shoulder and smiled. Very well sheltered. You can't see it from the road, and the trees could hide anything in there. Yes, that's why I like it. I can kind of spy on beachgoers from there, I said. How long have you been coming here? Abby asked me. For years, it used to be a place for me and my boyfriend to come out and visit, before the town expanded. There weren't that many people then. 
We tended that hidey hole of mine. Ours. <laughs> Helped those trees and bushes grow from seedlings to what they are now. I said, smiling. You two did good work. Even though I didn't notice you there the first few rainy nights I came to your town. Between the mists and fog, I guess I got lost in my own thoughts. Abby said, taking a stone and tossing it gently into the water. The surf camouflaged the sound of it hitting the ocean. If you don't mind me asking, where is he? Your boyfriend? Did you two break up? No, I said, trailing off. He died some time ago. This place helps me keep his memory alive, since it was our place. I'm sorry for your loss. Would you like to talk about it, or just sit and watch the surf? I'd like that, watching the surf with you. I feel safe with you here. I don't know why, either. You have this air about you, I told her. I get that a lot. Don't ask me why. My dad used to tell me. Abby stood on the slippery rocks as though she'd been a gymnast with perfect grace and balance. Abigail, he'd say. You're a curious one. You didn't get that damned curiosity from me or your mother. Are you part cat? Abby made a pointing motion downward, emulating her father pointing down at a little child. Come on, Dad, why would you say that? It's something about you, little girl. I'm your father and she's your mama. You should be coming to us to learn things and feel safe, you know? He'd say, all confounded. Instead, we come to you. You know so much and don't seem scared of anything. I feel safer around you than my biggest friend. Abby's eyes grew solemn then, lost in thought. She smiled softly. You must have really loved your dad, I said, smiling at her. Still do. He's an ornery old man, but it's my pops, she said, sitting once more. Tossing another stone into the sea, her hair matted to the sides of her head. My Jason was a special one. Both of us college educated, loving science and the ocean. It's why we came to New England, to be near the water, study the critters that lived here, help protect them, I told her. Abigail noticed my sigh and asked if I was okay. I told her I was, then continued. I tried to continue, but couldn't find my voice. Abigail turned around fully to face me, the water touching the small of her back. Lori? Lori, what killed you and Jason? She asked me, touching my shoulder. I couldn't deny her amber eyes. We'd come here to guard the turtle hatchlings one summer night. Jason was closest to the water as he made sure the path was clear for the babies to make it back to the sea. It was raining hard that night. Lots of fog, mist, and wind. I began. I was getting my rain boots from the car. I watched as Jason used a stick to clear rocks and seaweed from the beach. My phone rang, and I went to turn the ringer off so it didn't disturb the turtles. I heard a yell. I thought Jason was calling for me to come down. When I turned his way, I screamed in horror as some scaly thing clawed at Jason's body. Abigail held me steady as I recalled the memory. Go on. I, I didn't think. I reacted. My man was in trouble. That black-eyed sea thing had my man. Jason would not have hesitated to save me. How could I do any different? Grabbing the fishing rod, I, I raced to Jason. There was so much blood. Jason had been surprised. He never had a chance to fight. His back was torn to shreds. He tried crawling to me, to yell a warning, but fear and rage filled me. I told Abigail as my hands shook. I planted the weak end of the fishing pole in the thing's eye. It hissed and lashed out. I opened my shirt to show Abigail the place where the beast ripped open my chest. 
God, the fire in my chest overcame me. I fell to the ground as it pulled the rod from its remaining good eye. I told her. With what little strength I had left, I tried pulling myself and Jason away from the beach, to the hidey hole. In my mind, as I pulled us slowly up the shore, I liked to think Jason was saying, I love you, through those bloody lips. But I knew he was dead. His eyes locked onto mine forever. I hadn't realized that Abby and I had walked back to the hidey hole. She was sitting me down, and I hadn't realized it. I couldn't pull Jason anymore. I'd lost too much blood by then. The creature had plugged its eye with seaweed and had come back for us. It grabbed Jason's leg and pulled him to the water's edge. I could only protest weakly. I watched as it crouched at the water's edge, waiting. What did it do then? Abby asked. Laugh. It gurgled a laugh, I said. As the last of my life spilled onto the beach, I noticed the sands turning and being pushed up in various spots. The turtles, Abby said quietly. Yes, the realization dawned on my dying brain. It had come to snack on the helpless baby turtles. We'd gotten in its way. We would all die that night, Jason, me, and those turtles. That thing would eat us all. I said, realizing I could no longer cry. I was a ghost, a dead thing myself. All I had was the speech. They, they never found us, did they? I asked. Abby shook her head. Lori Alverson and Jason MacArthur were presumed washed out to sea during the storm of 07, along with several other beachgoers, Abigail stated. Did you notice anything else in this cove, Lori? I shook my head and looked at her. You and Jason were not its only victims, but your attachment, outside of that one there, Abigail pointing south, I could barely make out the shape of a male a quarter mile away. It killed him too. But the energy that used to be Lori Alverson spoke to me first. I looked at Abigail much as her father must have. Who, what are you, Abigail? I asked. She sat next to me and looked out into the sea. Look there, Abby exclaimed, pointing at the sand. They churned and moved. I hadn't noticed. In the years since my death, this is the first time I've been here to witness the emerging of the turtles. Oh, Abigail! I cried out. A beautiful sight, yes, but I fear dinner time is upon us. I say we do a few things tonight. Let's give those babies a fighting chance and avenge the murders of Lori Alverson and Jason MacArthur and that old fart down the beach. What do you say, Lori? Abby asked, her amber eyes glowing now. I say, yes. We sat quietly for a while. I don't know for how long, but soon a scaly figure would emerge from the waters and mists. We both smiled. The two of them were walking along the ice, barely specks on a vast, colorless expanse that seemed to stretch forever out and up until it melted into the sky. A smattering of huge yellow stars cut through the permanent dusk, casting the suited figures in gray silhouette. I've had enough of this, Buren said. He was lagging slightly behind, his ankle twinging every couple of steps. He paused to right his helmet the visor of which was beginning to tilt slightly to one side, obscuring his view. Ford, who had long since lost patience with Biren's lamentations, stopped abruptly and turned around to berate him. What do you suggest we do then, Fagling? Don't call me a coward, Biren spat. He lowered himself laboriously to the glistening ice, 
and settled with a thud and a sigh. I wish I could take this damned helmet off, he said wearily, resting his head in his gloved hands. My nose itches, and this air tastes like a spoon. I wish you would take it off, growled Ford, turning his back on the sitting Biren. Fuck you, muttered Biren. He looked sullenly down at the swells of gray-blue ice between his legs. The two waited in fuming mutual silence for a long moment, each listening to the other's breath over the comms. Around them, the ice fields glittered like a sea of imperfect diamonds under the light of hideous stars. Ford was the first to speak. What do you remember? he asked. Right before the crash. Biren raised his head, the dark eyes behind the thick glass of the visor rising bemusedly before he climbed to his feet. He favored his left ankle, resting his weight on his right leg. Well, he said, with a shaky inhalation of scrubbed oxygen. I remember chaos. We were in the cabin, you, me, and Traeger. The mag drive was on cooldown. we just entered the system. The cartographers were doing their initial scans. We were about a hundred thousand kilometers out, still approaching pretty fast. Ford nodded, gesturing impatiently with one hand. Yes, I remember. The APAP had woken us up. Get on. Biren flashed Ford his middle and forefingers. We were about a hundred thousand kilometers out. Four minutes later, we were breaking Atmo, full reverse mag. Something must have gone wrong with the props, because we should have been going much slower. We came in too hot on a wrought-up trajectory, and ended up in the northern hemisphere. I was out before we hit. Yeah, Ford agreed. The forward view plates were burning, everything in the cabin glowing orange and red, like the inferno. I could feel the heat through the suit. I blacked out, too. We never should have left the crash site, Biren said sharply. It was protected, in that depression in the ice, and there was oxygen left, if we'd just looked for it. We had to leave, Ford said, forcing calmness. Did you see the way the ice was cracked? Spidery. Like glass? It was unstable, and the repulsors in the mag drive were compromised. If we weren't vaporized in the explosion, we'd be swallowed up by the ice. Biren was shaking his head. So what? What then? We march until we die of exhaustion? Under foreign stars? We're doomed, Ford. We died the moment we broke Atmo at 30,000 kilometers per second. No! Cursed Ford, stomping one boot on the ground. Damn it, how can you give up? We made it. We were in space for 20 years, Biren. We slept for 20 years. We discovered a wet planet. We can't give up now. I can't give up. Now it was Ford's turn to rest his helmeted head in his hands. I can't, he said quietly. I'm going back to the ship, Biren said. It may be rubble, but at least my grave will have a marker. You can't keep walking until you freeze or asphyxiate. He turned to leave. Fine, you can join Traeger's corpse, Ford shouted at the departing Biren's back. He ignored Ford's bluster, raising a hand to his helmet, and there was an audible click as Biren muted the radio. Ford watched him go, epithets unheard spilling from his thin lips. Bastard, he muttered, then went on his way, marching without direction on the endless ice. It was not in Ford's nature to accept defeat. He was not stupid. He knew when the odds were not in his favor. But to give up. Oh, to give up was the worst of sins. He felt sympathy for Biren. Truly, he did. He had been a conscript in the Northern European hegemonic military, just like Ford, and had been drafted into the Cosmic Exploratory Service straight out of BASIC. They'd gone through the core training at the same time, but hadn't yet met when the crew selection committee had sent out the assignment rosters. He remembered holding the ethereal hollow pad in his hands, reading the white neon words in their severe, angular font. To Cadet Oscar Ford, re-duty placements. 
the subject line read. He was standing in his dorm room aboard the Skripochka orbital training base, his back to the low, white-sheeted bed, dressed in his skivvies. You have been selected for extrasolar operations. In one month's time, you will begin additional training on board the Volca 14 Exploration Shuttle, designated the NEHM Georgi Beregovoy. His knees went weak, and he collapsed backward onto the thin mattress. Extrasolar operations. He sucked in a shuddering breath. The Georgi Beregovoy Exploration Shuttle. So they were trying again. Maybe this time they'd found something. It was no secret that the NEH and the other Earth governments were trying to establish a foothold outside the known solar system, beyond the familiar orbits of the local cluster, desperate to find salvation secreted in the light of some other star. The massive domed cities that housed the remaining population were a stopgap, and everyone knew it. The atmosphere was dissipating, slowly evaporating just like the oceans. Even the melting of the ice caps couldn't stop it. He set the pad aside, marking the messages read before lying back on the bed. Aus! He barked, and the lights dimmed to darkness. He laid there in the dark, pondering the committee's decision. One month. Twenty-two years later, they were crashing into the northern hemisphere of the planet called Kolkhov. Damn you, Baron. Ford sighed as he walked. Damn you. And damn Traeger. Damn... A shockwave tore through the ice underneath him, knocking him off his feet, and the surrounding fields of ice were suddenly, brilliantly illuminated for just a moment as an explosion bloodied the sky behind him, like a blow from a nuclear fist. He landed on his chest with a thud. Winded, he struggled onto all fours, looking at the afterglow of what was doubtless the detonation of the unstable mag drive of the NEHM Georgie Beregovoy. Baron, he breathed. He pushed himself up and began to run towards the shifting obelisk of smoke in the horizon. Dear Christ, dear Christ, he hissed, the words out of his mouth before he could hear them, and he ran, boots slipping awkwardly on the ice, but he didn't fall. The fire burned white, brighter than the stars in the sky. He'd met Biren on the shuttle ride out of the Beregovoy. He was a small man, quiet, deadly serious. Do you know the odds of us making it into another system? He had asked when Ford strapped himself into the seat next to him. Ford turned in surprise to the morose little man with a high forehead and severe dark eyes at his left. No, he said. It's not my job to concern myself with the odds. The man ignored him, answering his own question. Longer than a Siberian weekend. We're going to the training station with a thousand other recruits. What are the odds of us being picked? Ford snapped back. You should be grateful. We are hope incarnate, the steely spirit of European progress. We go forth in spite of the odds, not in fear of them. You sound like a propo. Biren scoffed, referring to the hegemony's corpse of propagandists. Better a propo than a cynic, where cynicism led mankind. Cynicism is honesty. Propaganda are lies. I'd rather be mired in truth than propelled forward by a lie. Ford didn't know how they'd become friends after that first conversation. He wasn't sure if they even were friends, but he knew he cared for the man. His own views were patriotic, stoic, and he was proud of his pragmatism. Biren had leanings to the old left, his way of thinking an anachronism from before the great party had come to power and united Europe under one rule. Still, he found himself unable to fault Biren for his views. He even respected him for sticking to his beliefs, although he found the man's doom and gloom outlook wearisome and tired. Biren! He was shouting into the mic. He could hear his breath echoing loudly inside his helmet and through his speaker, tinny and metallic gasps. No reply came from Biren. Ford continued to run toward the crash site, the smoke from the wreckage beginning to thin out. Many minutes of cursing and jogging later, he paused to catch his breath, grateful for the near-Earth-normal gravity. 
He stood there panting in silence, alone on the ice with the vanishing smoke before him. Ford, came a voice over the radio. Ford, are you there? Ford jumped in surprise before answering hurriedly. Biren, Biren, is that you? Are you hurt? The voice came back through a fog of static. I'm fine, Biren said. I've fallen through the ice. There's something down here that... He trailed off. There was something in the man's voice that made Ford very frightened indeed, a distance that was more than miles. He replied, What? What's down there? You have to see for yourself. I'm going to try and climb out. I'll meet you on the ice. The ship is destroyed. Recommended radio silence for now. A robotic sigh came through the speakers. Then, Good luck, Ford. Be careful on your way back. It didn't take long for Ford to find where Biren had gone under. He could make out the crater in the ice where the ship had been some distance away, and all around it, dark blue radial fractures. A white crevice had formed several hundred yards out, and he could see Biren's suited silhouette on the ice beside it. He was resting on his knees, helmet in his hands. Ford's eyes went wide. He sprinted toward him, shouting, Put it on! Put it back on, you damned fool! But as he neared, Biren raised his head and turned in his direction. Ford slowed as Biren smiled humorlessly at him. His dark eyes remained aloof. You can take your helmet off, Ford, he said. He held up his own, showing a long vertical crack in the faceplate and a small triangular hole near the base. Ford stared dumbly. Biren should be dead, yet there he was. He wondered if they were both dead, consigned to this cold, distant hell for some forgotten sin. I don't understand, he said. He didn't remove his helmet. We're not on Kulkov, Biren said. The rueful smile returned. We never left, Ford. This is Earth. That's impossible, Ford said. That's impossible. What about mission control? What about the orbital stations? Someone would have picked us up. Someone would have course corrected. What about the automated pilot assistance program? It should have sent an SOS as soon as we diverged. Biren shook his head. Those are good questions. Nice that you're finally asking questions, Ford. You forgot the most important one of all, though. What's that? Where did we crash? The ice caps were melting and the oceans were drying up. We should have landed in a desert. Yet here we are. Ice all around. So? What does that mean? You said it yourself. Twenty years. We were supposed to be asleep for twenty years, Ford. But a planet doesn't lose and regain its ice caps in twenty years, Ford. We were up there for nearly two thousand years. At this, Ford burst into braying, disbelieving laughter. Scheisse, he said. Oski Max Foxen. Where's your proof? Baron shook his head, saying, It's not bullshit, Ford. I'm breathing the proof. He paused, then asked, Do you want to see what I found under the ice? Ford looked at him pointedly. Fine, he said after a moment. Show me. The chasm was deep and steep, but Biren pointed out the safe spots to clamber down, and Ford dutifully followed the muffled directions and pointed fingers. What's down here? he asked. You'll see, Biren said, still aloof. Ford wondered if the little man was enjoying this, reveling in his uncertainty and near panic. The mystery is not appreciated, Biren. Not yet came the reply. After a few minutes of silent sliding and hopping from safe spot to safe spot, Biren told Ford to stop. What? Ford asked, looking back up the slope they had come down. It was precarious and slick, with a minimum of handholds, and he considered that it must have been quite a task for Biren to make his way out of here in the bulk of the spacesuit, even with the micro-motors and the joints assisting his agility. How did you manage to climb out of here so quickly? He asked. 
Ford looked down from the flat spot upon which they stood, seeing how much further the crevice went. He squatted down to pick up a loose chunk of ice. He studied it, and something about it seemed wrong somehow. It had the slick texture and sheen of some kind of gelatin, and there appeared to be latticework of tiny purple lines running through it. To him, they looked almost like veins. If he didn't know better, he would have guessed it was organic. He stood up, letting the chunk fall. Biren, enough, he said, beginning to turn. What could possibly be? Biren's gloved hand struck him hard in his chest plate, and he lost his balance, tumbling backwards. Oh, he gasped, reaching for his betrayer as he sailed out into the blue dark. What? The person who had been standing on the ledge with him was not Biren. As he watched... The thing that had pushed him changed, the features it had borrowed from his friend running and melting together in grey rivulets, the flesh falling away, and the suit sagged inward before it too liquefied, and the whole thing dropped to the ground in a noxious puddle. Ford went into the abyss. It was dark for a long time. He felt his body break on the ice below, bones snapping like dry sticks in a burlap sack, but the pain was a far away thing abstract and useless. He opened his eyes to take in what he could of his surroundings, seeing barely more than when they were closed. He tried to sigh, but a sucking wheeze and an upwelling of hot, salty blood from deep inside his chest made him stop. He swallowed the blood, praying it wouldn't make him sick, and breathed shallowly, waiting to die. Realizing that that was his only option, had been from the moment they'd crashed here. His eyes flicked to a sudden movement on his faceplate, a splintering in the glass that began to spread down from the corner above his right eye. He watched the crack grow, and to him it seemed like a slinking predator, creeping up on him on its belly. It was then that he noticed a tiny light, blinking slowly, fading in and out to his right. He tried to turn his head, but his vision swam and he stopped. He tried again and nausea accompanied the blurred vision this time, but he ignored it. Lights on, Ford whispered, and the helmet's front-mounted lights flicked on, cutting through the darkness. They illuminated high, smooth walls of deep blue, fading to white ice extending above him. It took him two minutes to fully turn his head, and when he did, he tried to scream, not just from the pain, but from what he saw. It was Biren. The light Ford had seen was the level indicator on his back-mounted oxygen tanks. His body lay less than a meter away on its belly, and his helmeted head was facing Ford's. A long, vertical crack ran down the visor to a small triangular hole near the base, and behind the glass, his face was ashen, the skin hard and cold, the dark eyes like glass beads swelling from their sockets, a bloated purple tongue pressed between the teeth a trickle of frozen blood tracing a thin, black line from the corner of the open mouth. Ford tried to scream again, produced only a wet wheeze that splattered thick blood on the inside of his faceplate, and he tried to turn away. But he couldn't. His neck wouldn't move. His mind reeled. What had pushed him? Whose voice had he heard on the radio? Biren, he burbled. The ice beneath him moved. It was a sudden, juddering vibration, over after a moment, but Ford felt his supine body move with it. What? he said. He looked as far upwards as he could with his limited neck mobility, cranking his eyes all the way to the left. He couldn't see much past the shining of the lights, just the walls of the chasm. Then the ground moved again, and he felt himself rolling toward Biren's corpse. He heard a sound through the material of the helmet, a humming, roaring, cracking sound, and a memory came to him from his boyhood. He and his father, illegally harvesting trees to burn. The sound around him now was like that, like trees falling. In his limited field of vision, he saw the walls of the chasm begin to convulse, contorting, twisting, running like melted wax, and the ground under him wouldn't stop moving. It heaved him onto Biren's body, and he landed with his broken hips across Biren's back. The crack sprayed across the visor, 
then the glass spider webbing. Chips of glass rained into his puffy face. The last thing he saw was the walls closing above him, tendrils of blue and gray matter forming between them, pulling the sides together like sutures in a wound. The visor burst, but he was crushed before he could suffocate. A final thought went through his mind as the living ice pressed in. We are not welcome here. The surface of the planet above the bodies of the two men began to shift, to merge, the crater of the ship's impact swelling, reforming, the fractures closing. In a matter of minutes, the planet called Kolkov had healed itself, and it was as if man had never been there at all. I live in a small community in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. I won't say exactly where, but I live in one of the many canyons that people have taken to residing in. In my canyon, there couldn't be more than 100 people all living in it. It's a quiet place. Every once in a while, you'll hear a firearm go off to scare away a bear or a mountain lion. There's a creek that runs adjacent to the town, and it has natural trout living in it. It's a lot of fun to fish, as I recall. I spent many a summer day catching dinner for my mother and father. But all of that was in the past. There was a story everyone in the canyon told that supposedly happened in the late twenties. They called him the Goodnight Murderer. He was an older fellow, late sixties or so, that lived off in the woods alone. He seemed to be homeless due to his stench and never changing attire. They say he was weird and the loner type. He'd often come to the local general store and sell skins to the owner, who would turn them into jackets, boots, and other such things. He'd buy small provisions, some food and water, canned goods and the like, and be on his way. He was well known because of this and everyone knew who he was. He didn't speak much, only the store owner could say what he sounded like. Once, rumor has it, he came in with a bear pelt. Lord only knows how he managed to get that. Well, he was a bit standoffish, and every time he'd come into town, he'd cross the river. He didn't use any conventional means either. He'd wade right through its depths. He'd leave in that fashion too. Seriously, he was crazy. As far as anyone could tell, he lived by himself, somewhere in the woods beyond the river. No one ever saw him outside of town, so... They figured he lived pretty far out of town. No one dared follow him. Partly out of fear, I presume. Partly out of disgust. Well, rumors started to spread about him making a shrine to some god out of the bones of the things he killed. He bathed in the blood of his fresh kills and howled to the moon like a wolf. There were other things too, like he was an old world warlock, making potions and rituals to one day rule the world. Mostly nonsense and campfire stories. Until one day, in late August, when a boy came running back from his expeditions outside late at night. Being that close to nature, it was generally a good idea to be inside a home by 9.30 at the latest, but he'd slipped out. A real Tom Sawyer type, and he went by the creek to play. He'd been out there by himself for about ten minutes, throwing stones and listening to the splashing, when he came out of the woods. He was standing on the opposite bank, watching the kid when he called out gruffly. Good night, isn't it? The kid was surprised, but he pretended not to be and called back. Yeah, great night, but I think I should be going home. He started to walk away when he heard a loud splash. He turned to see the man wading through the waters, halfway across the stream with a long, silver hunting knife drawn. The kid raced back home and told his parents. They didn't think much of it, thinking he'd made up the story just to get back inside without suffering too much punishment. They sent him off and thought nothing of it. A week later, a local couple were found gutted and stabbed by the river. The boy obviously trying to defend the woman, but neither of them got away. The local police were shocked that there was a murderer in their midst. They were used to seeing mangled people, but the only murders around there were done by the local wildlife 
or exposure. They acted quickly and got coroners over from the bigger city to examine the bodies. There wasn't much they told that was new. It was done by a knife, and the intestines were removed after both victims were dead. After that event, the police secluded a curfew after 9 p.m. Anyone out were to be arrested, interrogated, and at the very least had to spend the night in the county jail. They took this seriously and caught a few of the more risk-taking kids, but that's all that came of it. After a few months, the curfew was eventually lifted, though they were going to continue patrolling at night. It was about a week later when two officers responded to a scream they heard while out on patrol. They went down to the creek and found a young boy, the same Tom Sawyer type, tied by his ankle to a tree. His throat was slit and his intestines were hanging out of his open stomach. It was a gruesome scene, and the curfew was re-established after that incident. Rumors began to spread that it was the hermit man who sold skins that was doing the killings. That he'd walk out from the forest late at night and ask you, Good night, isn't it? And then kill you for whatever reason. The police began waiting for him to come back with his usual skin trade, to ask him some questions. Some of the town folk even began exploring the woods, armed and ready. He never showed, and no one knows what happened to him. Rumor has it, if you're out alone in the middle of the night by the creek, he'll come out and ask you about the night, and try to kill you. That's all just a story anyway, or so I thought. I often spent my evenings outside in the cool air, sometimes watching the fireflies, sometimes wandering the well-explored nearby woods. Sometimes I'd try to catch a few fish before dinner. This one evening, I wasn't having any luck. The sun was setting, and I just couldn't get any fish to bite, despite the night crawlers looking fat and juicy. The sun had gone down, and I was giving up hope. The crickets were out, and I got the sense my parents would soon start to worry if I didn't head back soon. I started reeling in my line when I heard a twig snap from across the river. There was an older man, dressed in fur and skins from what seemed to be many deer. He was looking right at me, and as I noticed him, he turned to the sky and asked, Good night, isn't it? A chill ran down my spine as he lowered his gaze back to me, expecting an answer. I nodded and swallowed my fear as I managed to say, Yeah, great night. He smiled, revealing perfect white teeth, and jumped into the river. I threw down my rod and made a mad sprint for my home. I live across from the stream, so I can see it from my house when it's day. I looked back over my shoulder to see him standing on the bank I was fishing on, holding my fishing rod out to me. He growled in a harsh, dry tone. You forgot something. And he was holding it, as if to hand it to me. In his other hand I saw something glint from the light of the moon, something long and silver. Already afraid and wise enough to know not to go back, I ran straight into my home and barred myself against the front door, expecting to hear loud thunderous footsteps in pursuit. My mom came to check and see what happened. She called my dad when she saw the state I was in. I couldn't speak, and my heart felt like it was about to beat out of my chest. I collapsed and my dad carried me into the living room, where there was a nice warm fire and hot cocoa. I felt scared, but safe in my own home again. My dad went to the door and looked out across towards the stream where I'd been fishing while I calmed down and sipped my cocoa. He came back and shrugged, shaking his head from side to side. When I calmed down, I told him what happened. They didn't believe me, of course. They thought I might have seen a deer or an elk and that I allowed my mind to play tricks on me because of the story. I know what I saw. I will not be outside by the stream after dark again. I still live up here. My father and mother live only a few houses away. I'm married now and I have two kids of my own. Two boys. I told them of that old campfire story and then I told them of my own. I warned them to never go near that stream after dark for any reason. I hope they listen to me, but I worry as a father. Thank you.